Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to AFSA on a snow day. And uh, so pleased to see some of the old friends here. To hear our colleague uh, Jerry Firestein, Ambassador Firestein, speak. Uh, this is the fifth year of AFSA speakers program, so we're delighted to host a variety of talks. So we do book uh, talks here. We have a variety of programs on uh, topics of interest to the Foreign Service. And today we have one of our most accomplished and experienced diplomats, Ambassador Jerry Firestein, here with us. He, we have him for an hour. We're grabbing him away from the mothership across the street. And uh, Jerry will uh, have plenty of time for questions uh, before he goes back uh, in about an hour. Uh, many of us know Ambassador Firestein. Uh, he is currently the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Near East Bureau. A very you know, low-pressure job, nine to five. And uh, so uh, in addition to that, he has, of course, been our ambassador to Yemen, where he battled al-Qaeda. Uh, his previous overseas tours include Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, Oman, <coughs> Israel, the Palestinian territories, Lebanon, and three uh, tours in Pakistan. So he's had his share of hardship posts. And the title of his talk today is Serving in Danger of Spots. I think he's mostly talking about Washington, though, right there? <laughs> so this will probably be a feature in the Washington Trade Craft course, looking forward. And I've served with Jerry in Washington, and he's uh, one of the top Foreign Service officers. And so let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to see so many uh, uh, familiar faces from uh, from times past, from World Cover and we are. Eric Boswell, when I got sworn in, uh, Eric was kind enough to come, and I, I mentioned that uh, Eric started my career as the NEA assignments officer in 1975, sending me off to Islamabad, so uh, uh, um, I have uh, one. And, and uh, favorable uh, uh, memories of, of Eric and, and Margaret Dean, who was my boss for a couple of years at NEA ARP, uh, and uh, a number of other people in, in uh, the, the room, uh, the Katniss and, and others. Um, I, I thought that I would just uh, talk for a few minutes, uh, and then I'd be happy to try to respond to any uh, comments or, or questions that, that you might have. And I, I mostly just wanted to, s to throw out uh, a few ideas, not necessarily uh, in a prepared way, but, but just some, some thoughts. And uh, as, as you can uh, probably guess, uh, th this issue of serving in, in dangerous posts and how uh, the U.S. government does that and, and how uh, we, we feel about uh, these things uh, is uh, very much on our plate in, uh, in NEA. Uh, it's an issue that, uh, that we deal with on a regular basis. And uh, uh, the reason I'm a, a little bit late coming here uh, this afternoon is that uh, we were just at a uh, briefing for the new Deputy Secretary, Heather Higginbottom, on the Benghazi attack and, and uh, uh, looking at everything that happened there. Uh, so uh, uh, this is certainly a, a, an issue that's, that's very present in, in our, our minds. And it, it brings me to the first point that I wanted to make, and that is uh, that when you talk about dangerous uh, uh, posts and how the, the USG manages uh, our presence in those places, uh, the, the world is easily divided into pre-Benghazi and post-Benghazi. And uh, fortunately for, for us, uh, most of my tour in, uh, in Yemen uh, was under the, the rules of the pre-Benghazi environment, which were difficult, and, and managing Washington was a big part of serving in uh, dangerous uh, posts. Uh, but it was a Washington that was able to consider uh, these issues much more rationally uh, and uh, was able to, I think, uh, come up with a much better balance uh, between uh, providing for security, ensuring that our people uh, were able to do their job safely, 
uh, but also ensuring that they're able to do their jobs, which uh, has always uh, been, uh, you know, the, the key criteria. And uh, I think uh, my first uh, my first critical threat post was to shower uh, in uh, in 1989. So I've seen the evolution of uh, of U.S. responses to to these uh, to these threats and to and to dealing with dangerous uh, posts uh, over a course of about a quarter of a century. Um, a real change came in uh, 2000. And and one, and, and the development of uh, what we called uh, expeditionary diplomacy, the idea that, that the, the Foreign Service was going to be out on the front lines of, of uh, diplomacy, but also of conflict against uh, uh, violent extremist organizations, but also in a number of other challenging environments. Uh, and uh, uh, I always uh, recall in uh, in that context, when I was in uh, the Counterterrorism Bureau, uh, we have a seat on the Accountability Review Board. So if there is an incident involving uh, loss of life or damage to facilities, uh, the uh, Counterterrorism Bureau is one of the bureaus that participates in the review afterwards. Uh, and uh, I always remember uh, um, uh, going to one on Basra, it was when Greg Starr was still the PDAS in, in DS, uh, and uh, it was unfortunately, it was an incident where a couple of our uh, locally engaged staff had been killed. Uh, so we were talking, and, and it turned out in the conversation that uh, much of our staff in Basra had spent uh, pretty much the last 30 days in bunkers because of indirect fire and, and their ability to move around and to do anything during this period uh, was pretty truncated. And somebody asked Greg uh, uh, how you know how we handled it, how we would have handled it in the past. And Greg said, "Well, it was very easy five or six years ago. This was about 2006 or 2007." He said, "You know, five or six years ago, the answer would have been very easy. We would have closed. Uh, there's no way that we would have ever stayed in a place like that." He said, "Now uh, we stay." because we're expeditionary and it's accepted that we're going to uh, continue to maintain a presence in these places even though uh, it, was, uh, it was difficult because we recognize that there is a need for our presence and that there is a job to be done and we've accepted that. Uh, that was the, the attitude pretty much from uh, 2000 and certainly from the uh, time of the of uh, the Iraq War in 2003 until uh, 2012 and the attack on Benghazi. Uh, since then, our attitude has changed dramatically. And once again, uh, we are in a situation and a position uh, where, frankly, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the senior leadership here in Washington uh, is increasingly risk averse and, uh, and uh, is increasingly unwilling to uh, do a real cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the, the overwhelming uh, desire of the leadership in Washington is to avoid uh, any threat to the security of our people or our facility. And so uh, that has uh, led to uh, a number of I would say negative consequences in terms of our ability uh, to maintain our presence. And uh, uh, so that's uh, the, the second element, the second key point that I would like to make, and that is how has the, the tightening of the security environment and, uh, and uh, particularly the austerity of how our diplomats uh, and personnel assigned to our embassies, how do they operate, how do they work, and how do they live uh, in, these, uh, in these circumstances. Um, and, and again, uh, I think that there are uh, a number of, of consequences. Uh, first, of course, is the move uh, to one-year assignments and unaccompanied assignments. Uh, the two are, are related. Um, I, uh, frankly, when I was in Yemen, uh, although there was a certain amount of encouragement for me to take a different position, 
uh, resisted the idea of a one-year assignment for uh, personnel assigned to Sana'a because I always believed that it was not possible, frankly, uh, for people to do a good job if they were only at a post uh, for one year. And, and in, in particular, uh, posts like Sana'a, posts like Pakistan, posts like Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, that are so intensely uh, uh, personality related, that are so dependent uh, on interpersonal relationships for you to be able to do your job, uh, you can't do that in one year. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, and again, if you're one year with two R&Rs, so that you come to a post and you're there for about a quarter, maybe 13, 14 weeks, then you go off on your R&R, &R. <clears throat> then you come back for maybe another 13 or 14 weeks, uh, then take your second R&R, &R, and then you come back for your last 13 or 14 weeks, at which point you're already looking to your next assignment, um, you don't get very much accomplished, unless you're an extraordinary performer. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I've found is that even if you know a place, even if you're familiar with a place, uh, coming back uh, and only trying to do it in one year is extremely difficult. I have spent more years than I care to remember um, working on Pakistan. I had been the country director in 2002, 2003, then went back to Islamabad in 2008, and found that just in the five years, uh, the country had changed, the personalities had changed, the, the nature of the, uh, the issues had changed, and, and I knew Pakistan very well, but I still uh, found it uh, a real learning experience, and within one year I couldn't have done it. Two years uh, was, was about right. So the, the turn to one-year tours, I think, uh, makes it much more difficult for the United States to achieve its diplomatic objectives in, uh, in these uh, posts. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that we're also very aggressive now in pulling out dependents. Uh, and so in order to get people to come, it's extremely difficult, and this was the consequence of my insisting on a two-year assignment for Sana'a, it's very difficult to get people um, to commit to two years on unaccompanied company post, uh, particularly at the middle grades, because you have um, at that point, usually uh, officers who have young uh, families, uh, who have spouses, uh, who uh, perhaps are, aren't uh, that excited about having you gone for a couple of years. Uh, and, and, so, uh, and so it's, it's difficult uh, to attract decent, uh, good middle managers uh, and the people that, that really could. Uh, build an embassy and from which you can benefit by having that kind of, of leadership in your embassy. So uh, that was one consequence. Uh, second consequence, I think, of, of, the, uh, of the tendency to, to focus everything on security and, and risk avoidance is the militarization of our, of our uh, embassies. Uh, when I left uh, Sana'a, uh, we had about 100 and somewhere between 105 and 110 Marines uh, with a cap on the number of Marines at 120. Um, uh, Marines are great. My son was a Marine. Uh, but uh, um, when you have that kind of a presence in your, in your embassy, it's noticed. Uh, and, uh, and there was an awful lot of negative commentary about uh, the, the presence of Marines at the embassy in the, in the press, and it, and it gave a certain uh, image of the U.S. and of the American embassies that wasn't necessarily a positive one. An awful lot of the, of the publicity, an awful lot of what was being presented in the newspapers and on TV was nonsense, of course, uh, but nevertheless it had sunk into a lot of people, and it, and it, uh, it was something that we had to push against constantly uh, um, in terms of what it was that we were trying to do and what kind of a relationship that we wanted to have with the enemy people. The third, uh, the, the third uh, consequence of, of the focus on security is, is the, the impact that it has on our personnel. Uh, and again, uh, uh, the restrictions uh, on movement, uh, the ability to get out into a community, 
uh, the ability to live in a community. When I first got to Sana in uh, the fall of 2010, uh, our personnel were housed in uh, apartments, mostly uh, around town, uh, decent housing. Uh, unfortunately, most of the housing that was suitable for, uh, for Westerners uh, was on the opposite side of the uh, city from the embassy. So we were in the northeast quadrant. Uh, most of our housing was in the southwest quadrant, and it meant uh, for most people about a 45-minute drive uh, from home to, to work every day. Uh, when uh, the situation deteriorated in Sana'a and, uh, and uh, there was fighting in, inside the city, uh, we made a decision that it was too dangerous for people to move back and forth across uh, the city to get to the work uh, and, and home, uh, even in FAVs. And so uh, we, as a temporary expedient, uh, moved people into a, a rather ramshackle hotel, uh, the Sheraton. Uh, thinking that this was for a few weeks or a, a couple of months until uh, until things quieted down. Uh, but the fact is that that was May of 2011. Uh, we made a couple of efforts after that to allow people to go back to their homes unsuccessfully. Uh, and uh, we now bought the hotel and uh, that is uh, going to be the permanent accommodation for our people until uh, new uh, housing is, is completed, it's under construction uh, until it's completed in uh, the embassy compound. Uh, but, but there are always costs and, and uh, uh, certainly one of the things that I thought was important when we were in Islamabad, even though that was also considered a critical threat post, was that people could get out at the end of the day and they could go to their homes. They had neighbors who were generally Pakistani. Uh, they could go to the markets, they could, they could be a part of the community. Uh, but uh, increasingly, uh, we are pulling back into a shell, and, uh, and really uh, most of our people have little or no contact with the host country nationals, uh, and the host country nationals have little or no contact with our, with our personnel. And that's not a positive thing, it doesn't help uh, uh, improve our relationships and it, it, it in many ways defeats the purpose of, of what it is that we're trying to uh, accomplish. Uh, there's an additional uh, cost which is that uh, we have moved people closer and closer to the embassy uh, and, uh, and also restricted their movements around town so that as we went through the various levels of, of uh, threat uh, in Sana'a. First we moved people out of their homes and into the hotel. Uh, then we uh, started restricting their ability to go to uh, restaurants, uh, then to supermarkets, and then uh, eventually uh, to go anywhere, frankly. And so uh, the hotel is about a kilometer away from the embassy. And for many of our people, particularly the people who don't have um, uh, a reason to get out and, uh, and go to meetings. They're not economic officers, they're not political officers, uh, it's our administrative staff, it's our consular staff. Uh, uh, those people are in a routine where they go between the embassy and the, uh, and the, the hotel and, and have really no experience of the country outside of that one kilometer route. Uh, back and forth between uh, uh, between work and, and home on a daily basis. It's uh, terribly <coughs> difficult, and I think from a morale standpoint, uh, uh, very very hard on people. Uh, it certainly doesn't uh, encourage people to uh, uh, to want to to extend. Uh, and then the fourth uh, the fourth uh, 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 negative consequence I would say is the speed uh, with which uh, the uh, the embassy uh, and, uh, and other facilities is put on either drawdown or, or uh, order departure or closed. And of course, uh, uh, last, uh, last August, uh, we went through the, uh, the exercise of closing about uh, 19 of our posts uh, throughout uh, the, the Near East and, and Africa. Uh, based on, uh, frankly, threat information that, uh, that was, was uh, questionable. And then it took a, a few days. The knee-jerk response uh, of, of Washington was to just order everybody to close. 
um, and then it took a couple of weeks really to get them to back off. Uh, in the case of Sana'a, um, it, uh, it led to a decision uh, because Sana'a was considered to be too sensitive to clues. It led to a decision that uh, it wasn't safe to move people back and forth between the hotel and, and the embassy a kilometer away. And therefore, we made people uh, for about two months uh, sleep on the floor in their embassy, in their offices, uh, which uh, also was not um, particularly popular. Um, and, that, and, and that brings me to the last point that I wanted to make, and that is uh, how does the State Department and how do our officers fit in with uh, fit in with uh, the rest of the foreign affairs community. Uh, and the point that I wanted to make here is that, uh, uh, in fact, the State Department uh, does not do as good a job as our colleagues in the intelligence community uh, or in the military in articulating uh, what it is that we do and why it is that we need to be overseas in the first place. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, particularly if you're in a post like Sana'a, uh, which has uh, a high level of uh, interest for the intelligence community because of the uh, presence of Al-Qaeda, uh, has a high uh, level of interest because of the military, uh, for the military because of the need uh, to try to build up uh, our partner uh, forces in the, in the Yemeni military and security establishments. Uh, they are quite aggressive and they are quite successful in insisting uh, to the White House and, and to the inner agency uh, that their people need to be there. Uh, the State Department does not do that uh, nearly as well as they do. And so when we come to a decision about order departure or, or uh, authorized departure or closure, um, often the uh, brunt of the decision falls on our state officers. So the people who get pulled out uh, generally are your admin officers, uh, your political and, uh, con and uh, economic officers, public diplomacy officers, uh, and, uh, and the agency and, and the military uh, stay on. Uh, I would say that that's exactly backwards. And when, uh, when, when I first got to post in uh, September of 2010, uh, we have a, uh, a training mission that is uh, manned by, uh, by SOCSEN, the uh, Central Command's uh, Special Operations uh, uh, Command. Uh, and uh, they're good guys, and they're doing an important job. There were about 100 of them uh, at the post when I got there. And uh, one day, uh, as I was getting my uh, briefings, uh, having arrived at the post, the, the colonel who uh, was in charge of this uh, unit came in and he explained to me in great detail about how, uh, although they came under chief of mission authority, uh, the fact of the matter is that if anything ever happened uh, that forced the embassy to close, uh, they of course would detach themselves from the embassy and they would stay on because of the importance of their mission and uh, because they couldn't afford to leave. Uh, so that was uh, the briefing and, and that was the view that they took. Well, about six months later, of course, we came to the point uh, where, in fact, we needed to uh, um, bring down the number of people. Uh, we, we had to come from about 350 to about 150. Um, they all left uh, because they had nothing useful to do at that point. I kept my political officer. I kept my AID director. I kept the public diplomacy people because they were the ones who were doing jobs that were relevant to the U.S. national interest at that moment. Uh, and, and I think that this is something that we have to, to um, state more clearly to people. And that is that when our host government leadership or when our populations in the countries where we're serving think about American embassies, they don't think about the intelligence community. They don't think about a bunch of people who are sitting staring at uh, computer monitors all day. They don't even think about the guys who are out training the military. What they think about is who's going to issue their visa. Um, the public diplomacy effort that we can make uh, in terms of getting our message out. Uh, the, uh, the assistance programs that we're operating, that AID is operating. 
and the political and economic officers who are getting around and doing the real substantive work of diplomacy. Uh, that's what people think of in an embassy, and that is something that we have to be much more aggressive about uh, defending and articulating as we go forward. Uh, we um, we uh, um, you know have uh, have to, to think through, and, and let me uh, just uh, conclude. If I can find my conclusion, uh, um, let me just conclude by by saying that uh, as as we go forward, this is uh, this is an area that we have to uh, that we have to fun uh, function in uh, much more successfully. Our our battle is less in the dangerous posts overseas than it is here in Washington. Uh, our battle is really convincing the interagency that what we do is important, and that and that uh, uh, we need people to do it. Uh, and so uh, the State Department, of course, uh, has developed some new uh, some new instruments. Uh, we have the VP2 uh, process uh, that hopefully can marry up. Uh, some uh, analysis of what is our national interest, what are our uh, core functions and requirements uh, against what is our staffing pattern and how many people do we need in order to do these jobs. Uh, it was, uh, we just finished the first one, uh, uh, the first one of these reviews with Tunis last week. Uh, it was painful. We succeeded, I think, in the end in, in establishing uh, that uh, we should have 10 more positions in, in Tunis. Uh, 10 is far fewer than we really need, uh, but it was good that we were able to accomplish at least that much. Uh, we'll go through a number of others. I think uh, uh, our colleagues in, in AF are, are just going through a similar exercise with Bangui. Uh, but, but we need, we need uh, instruments like this in order to get our building uh, to, to defend our presence and in order to get the interagency uh, to accept that our presence is important as uh, the military or the intelligence community presence and that what we do in terms of, of uh, promoting U.S. national um, uh, interests, uh, foreign policy interests, is uh, critical as well. So let me stop there. Uh, we have about 30 minutes or so. For sure. You're always welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me ask for questions uh, on any topic. Otherwise, I'll start calling on people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we are. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, well, have a, uh, we had the pleasure of serving together and. and uh, and uh, things we didn't have limitations then on our assignments and we didn't on the families and so on. But but uh, do I understand what you're saying, Jerry? That <coughs> given given the post Benghazi uh, <coughs> situation, and I'm afraid we probably will have more Benghazi, yeah, was there. and the impact, of course, that has on Congress and Washington. But but uh, can, if you, I gather you'd like to have at least two year assignments. Uh, and I gather from that you would like to have maybe dependents come out uh, on some some sort of basis, uh, and then you have another Benghazi. And and wh where does this lead us uh, in in terms of if you were really the director general and you could tell the Congress as well as the rest of the State Department what to do? Where would you have us on on the assignment process? I agree with you. One year is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, th those are good questions, of course, and, and, and my own thought is, um, uh, one, I think two-year assignments are critical, uh, but it's hard if you're asking people to serve two years um, on a company. Uh, um, it depends on the post, and I think that, that one of the things I would say is that, is that we, we've fallen into a kind of a knee-jerk reaction. So. Uh, if there is an issue, uh, the families come out. Uh, now in Sana'a, it's hard to argue that that's the wrong decision, uh, given the overall environment. Uh, you certainly couldn't have children in Sana'a. 
Uh, we do have uh, some ability to bring in uh, affected family members if they're going to, to work in the embassy. Uh, but but uh, I, I can understand and I, I don't challenge the, uh, the validity of saying that family shouldn't be in Sana'a. On the other hand, uh, it was a hard fight uh, to get families once they were pulled out of Cairo. It was awfully difficult uh, to, to argue and to get them back into Cairo. And I think that you could certainly say that, that Cairo was not um, Sana'a and that the, the risk and the threat uh, to Cairo was never the same. Uh, another post that you know very well, Tunis, uh, we still don't have families back, uh, even though uh, I mean, we, had, we had an incident. Uh, it was unfortunate. Uh, we were lucky that there was no loss of life there. Uh, uh, we have a new government in Tunis. We have a, a whole new uh, uh, administration and, and a focus. Uh, the Prime Minister is going to be here next week. Uh, and yet, uh, it's still our position. Uh, we have a, an excellent school in Tunis, uh, but it's still our position that families can't go back. And so uh, I think that I think that there needs to be a much more nuanced approach. Uh, uh, but but you also you also uh, you reminded me of what I wanted to say in conclusion, and that is that we have to have more uh, mature conversations about these things. Uh, we we have to be uh, willing to to have conversations both within the administration and up on the hill about what it is that we're trying to accomplish and what the trade-offs are. Uh, and and the, the, thing, the thing about Benghazi, I mean, Benghazi was a tragedy, uh, but the thing that, about Benghazi that has made it so difficult to manage, and, and Eric can speak to this better than anybody else, is what happened to this city. It was what happened in Washington, not what happened in Benghazi, that has become so difficult for Pat Kennedy and for the other senior leadership of the State Department to manage because the response was so irrational. Uh, and, and so we, we need to be able to go up and, and sit down and, and talk about, about these things in an adult way and say, yes, it's difficult, and yes, there may be more Benghazis. We hope not, but there may be. But um, what we're trying to accomplish by being in places like Benghazi is important enough to take the risk. It's an argument that the military never has to have with the Congress, uh, but we do, and we and we need to do that. I don't like to sound like an old boy, but I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who spent two years, two full years in Vietnam without my family. Uh, it was just sort of done. Yeah. And I don't remember many protests. No. <laughs> Jerry, hi. I'm Patrick Thoreau. So I, you know, I did Black September in Oman a long time ago, and not to brag about what happened then, but there was somebody approached this intelligently. Uh, in the months between May and September, when things fall apart, the department started looking for single officers and for officers who didn't have uh, school children, and replacing out the ones who did. Secondly, they took all the families just one country away. It's a lot different having, I mean, this knee jerk, everyone's got to go back to Iowa strikes with some of some of lunatic, but it's uh, basically all the families were either in Beirut or Athens. It was easy to get out, easy to see the families, and we all went on three-year assignments into the middle of the Civil War. So, I mean, what happened? So I'm from Iowa, so <laughs> I think it's like being thrown into the briar patch. <laughs> no briar patches in Iowa. Uh, but, uh, well, I, I think that, that we, we do do some of that. I, the, the problem with saying, and, and this is uh, basically the demographic that you get in places like Sanaa now is exactly, is exactly what you're talking about. Either you get, you know, uh, older officers uh, whose children are grown uh, and therefore it's no longer an issue, or you get very young officers, um, entry level or second tour, uh, who uh, don't have children. Uh, and that's great, and I must say that in 2011, uh, Elizabeth Richard and I were about the only two officers with more than four or five years' experience in the Foreign Service. Uh, we ran the embassy with, with entry-level and second-tour uh, officers, and they were fantastic. Uh, we had no complaints. Uh, but, but what you don't get is that middle management, the, the O2 and O3 officers, who are the ones who are most likely to have families, uh, who have the greatest difficulty uh, justifying leaving again uh, for two years, uh, 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 if not for, for one year, 
Uh, and and I think that, that you lose something. I mean, the burden on Elizabeth was immense in trying to mentor uh, a, a staff of, of inexperienced officers. She did a great job, uh, but you can't expect that every time. And uh, and I think it, it does a disservice to the to the young officers, frankly, and it does a disservice to the system uh, that we're not giving our middle management officers that kind of an experience. But we but we do do that. Uh, the other the other issue, of course, is that many of the uh, one year unaccompanied tours, uh, we do allow uh, officers to to keep their families at their last post, uh, and you can do that to a certain extent, uh, but it's usually expensive, uh, and it also burdens the post. I mean, it's one thing if you think that you're sending people away. So in August, uh, we we thought that it was a temporary um, uh, order of departure. <coughs> Uh, for our personnel, and that once we got ahead of this threat, uh, we would be able to bring people back. And so we made the decision uh, that rather than send people back to Washington, we were going to send them to Frankfurt. Uh, and we did. Uh, but that became problematic after a while because then um, they were stuck in Frankfurt, uh, didn't have a lot to do, spending a lot of money because uh, there isn't the kind of infrastructure to support uh, people in that situation in Germany as there is here in the U.S. Uh, and as it dragged on, it became more and more uh, uh, uncomfortable for people. Uh, and so in the end, we, we had to bring people back here uh, to, uh, to, to uh, settle down and, and to, to get some stability back into their lives. So it depends, again, on what kind of, a, uh, what kind of an expectation you have. Is this for two weeks uh, or is it for a year? Uh, and that kind of determines which way you go. I'm Bill Martin. Uh, I had two related questions. One is you mentioned earlier about how one of the DS leaders, I think it's Greg Starr, had said in the old days we would just close the post. And but it wasn't clear to me if you supported that old concept or no, did you, do you think that in some of these cases we just should just close and stop trying to create some sort of fortress so that we can stay places that we should just close? So I'd be interested to have your point of view on that. Second of all, I was wondering, do you think that the world has changed? So not just that you know, other things have changed, but the world has changed so that we're, we face a new, the, the, the new baseline in terms of security particularly in the region that you're working in, or others as well, has changed so that we have to have a new way of looking at how we serve overseas. Is that better? Can people hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, on, on the first question, I, I think uh, uh, the answer is, uh, again, issues like the VP2 process. And, and what the VP2 process uh, does is it forces you to, to articulate what is, what is the reason for staying where you're staying. Um, why, why are you in Basra? Why are you in Sanaa? Um, I happen to think that, for the most part, we're in these places for good reason. But if you can't explain it, if you can't convince people that it's important to be there, then yeah, we shouldn't be there. Uh, uh, I, again, I, I think that I think that we made the right decisions in 2003 of, of saying that you know that we recognize the importance of having an American diplomatic presence in these very difficult posts uh, because we do work that, that otherwise wouldn't get done. And we present a, 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 a face of the United States that otherwise wouldn't be seen. And I think it's a face that, uh, that is um, important for people. Uh, but, but there may be times where you, where you look and, and say it's not worth it. Uh, not in the uh, Near East Bureau, but I know that we just went through uh, a huge battle in, uh, in the department and in the interagency about Juba uh, in South Sudan. Uh, and uh, it was precisely this question: Why are we? Why do we even bother to be in Juba? Um, and it was very difficult, I think, for the Africa Bureau at the end to to make the argument successfully. We came very close to to simply uh, pulling out and, and saying, "Forget it." 
uh, there. I think it would have been a mistake, and I think that our leadership in the department thought it was a mistake, and we eventually won the argument. Uh, but that was the, the context. Uh, in terms of the change in the, in the world, um, it, it's hard. It's hard to say. Uh, uh, I, I think it. I think it has. Um, certainly, the the Islamabad that I was served in from 2008 to 2010 was different from the Islamabad that I was in in 1976 and, and 77, uh, and different than uh, than uh, Pat and Bernie. But but um, but it is what it is. I mean, this is the way the world is now. We have to adjust to it, and we have to. Uh, we have to, to make uh, our, our decisions. I, I still don't think that the correct response is to build these fortresses and to bring in uh, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of Marines and, and to basically shut us all, ourselves off. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a um, Matthew Sada from AFSA. Um, I would just say on behalf of the organization, I think that uh, we would agree with many of the points of view that you're espousing here and the need to engage, to get out there, not to have these fortress Americas set up. I was back recently uh, from a trip out to Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, taking a look at some of our embassies, meeting with some of our AFSA members in the field. And one of the things that we heard was the uh, a decline in necessarily the authority of the chief of mission. Some of the decisions that used to be made out in the field now being made here in Washington. Uh, and I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on your experience, you know, going from Sana to now the bureau. I mean, you're seeing this. You're now on the other side, perhaps. And, and I think it's absolutely right now. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but seeing to the extent that again, Washington is getting involved in decisions that used to be done completely at a post level or at a, a mission level, and now to have again, whether it's the bureau, whether it's the seventh floor involvement, whether it's interagency, can you just talk a little bit about how again the bureau is trying to manage something like that, but also working with the chief of mission <coughs> at the post. No, it, it's absolutely uh, um, true, and, and it, it's, a, it's a huge frustration. It was a huge frustration for us in the field, and I know that uh, uh, Ann Patterson felt the same way sitting in Cairo when I was sitting in Sana'a. And, uh, you know, the, the amount of micromanagement of, of what used to be uh, post decisions uh, is, um, is really remarkable. Uh, and it's not, it's not only in state. I think that in many ways state is re reacting to, uh, um, to what's happening in the interagency and what's happening at the White House. Uh, and that uh, in some ways some of the decisions that Pat Kennedy is making, for example, uh, are, uh, are taken uh, in view of the fact that if he doesn't do it, uh, some um, you know, GS-13 and, and the NSC is going to do it. So uh, some, of, some of the things that, that we encountered when we were over, I mean, uh, several things. One, we were sending in on a daily basis uh, um, our personnel count. Uh, every time that uh, we wanted to change somebody, uh, that even if it was somebody going home on leave and somebody was coming out to, to um, stand in for them, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, of transfer, uh, had to come back to Washington for approval. Uh, uh, any uh, visit uh, uh, to our post had to be approved by Pat Kennedy personally. He reviewed every single um, uh, travel request uh, and decided. And frankly speaking, sometimes um, uh, I think, again, in, in a way that did a disservice to the Foreign Service because uh, you know it certainly seemed to us that the uh, bar for uh, getting a, um, uh, an aid personnel was a lot higher than it was for getting some you know, tech sergeant out. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, in, in a way, the, the whole process was structured uh, to once again shift the, uh, the, the profile, to shift the nature of the post uh, in a way that favored the IC and favored the military against uh, our, our traditional diplomatic presence. So, uh, so all of those things happen. The other point that I would make is a huge number of um, IPCs, 
DCs, PCs, uh, so that it's not only what happens inside of this building, it's that every single decision is uh, kicked into the interagency process, uh, and that, uh, and that uh, you know, things that Ambassador Patterson says when she was a, a DAS in, in uh, WHA 20 years ago, things that she would have made on her own dime now go to the Principals Committee for a decision. And half the time they spend an hour, an hour and a half discussing things without ever coming to a conclusion. And it goes around and around and around, Eric knows this, uh, um, uh, without ever coming to any kind of a conclusion. So it's an enormously dysfunctional and frustrating process. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, it's the folks that really have to bear the brunt of, uh, of that inability to make decisions. David Scott, I'm from the uh, Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan. And a contemporary example of this with the nano group for us and then the uh, uh, ICs and DCs is in the case of South Sudan where we had only Ambassador Page, where they cut all of the staff except for our ambassador and then added 60 something folks from AFRICOM to protect her. And then when they were having these various interagency conclaves here, was ex those are information driven. So each of those have discussion papers. And so it, it led to Ambassador Page with no staff, not even an IT person, to have to feed the beast, as they say. And we're perfectly 12 hours away. And so therefore, all night long, it's open lines to Washington in the day to acquire information in a country that doesn't status quo ante of the hostilities, even have a phone system, so it requires you physically to go places to try to seek meetings. So there's a reductio ad absurdum as we speak. <laughs> Daniel Fennell, I'm a foreign service officer. I'm currently assigned to a new bureau called uh, Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Uh, used to be part of uh, SCRS, now it has its own assistant secretary. Um, one of the things that we think uh, uh, is that they step back is that there's a lot of a lot of our management of crisis is is management. Uh, it's reaction. It's trying to find resources. It's putting up uh, a, a carapace wall. It's bringing people back and forth. And in some instances, I think we, we lose the opportunity to do the uh, the onboard analysis. I think uh, that my colleague was just talking about that. In some cases, we're tasked out with the reaction rather than allowing the folks on the ground to participate in the analysis of what we can do or what change we can make to affect the, the situation so that we don't have the crisis in the first place. Um, so I'll put a pitch in that, with the, that, this, that this new bureau in some ways is trying to stand up in an exact uh, reaction to this circumstance, and maybe it's the right time this can, this can add to uh, both the NEA and any other geographic bureau, uh, go through its analysis, its analytics, and, and the reactivity of the conflict experts that it brings to bear. Uh, in some cases, that's a foreign service element. In some cases, it's act outside expertise. So I'll just mention that as well. I thank you very much for your service. Thank you. No, and in fact, uh, we have a very good working relationship with CSO and with Rick Park. And, uh, you know, the, the role that CSO was playing in, in Syria. Uh, and also, I think we're, we're looking at the possibility of uh, some activities in Libya. So, uh, absolutely. Time for one, two more questions. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Sharon Featherstone. I'm the Senior Assignment Officer for NEA, SCA, and CSP Post in HRCDA. So I am assigning folks to all of your posts. We have, that, we have that in common. They're all going to Yemen, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, they're all going to Yemen. Just got another handshake this morning. So that's good. Uh, here's my question. We have created this collective of five posts, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and Libya that we collectively call the PSP posts. We have uh, an early bid cycle for them. We offer links as an inducement to service, early handshakes. We throw a lot of extra money at these folks, and I have no quarrel with any of that. Last week, in meeting with the Bureau, I was asked by one of the Bureau assignment officers, gee, we can't fill Beirut. We just don't understand why. I said, I know why. It's obvious to me. Why would you go to Beirut for two years when you can go to Baghdad for one and make twice the money? So 
I'm just interested in your thoughts, where you are now in being able to guide the direction that we're going in. Are we headed for an ever-expanding PSP collective where we begin folding in posts like Beirut and Tunis, maybe even Khartoum and Juba, or are we headed in the direction, the other direction, where we are going to attempt to normalize the now PSP posts? I just would be interested in your thoughts on that. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more, and, and I hope that the answer is the latter. Uh, and actually, uh, um, I've had an opportunity over the last few years to, to talk to Pat Kennedy about it. Uh, and, and I think that he understands certainly what, what the dynamic is, what the problem is that, that's been created uh, because of some of these decisions. Um, we we uh, uh, also were not the beneficiary of some of these programs because we did insist on a two-year assignment for, for Sana'a. And, and for precisely the reason that you uh, elaborated, which is why go to Sana'a for two years if you can go to Kabul or Baghdad for one year. Uh, and, and so it was a problem. And, and then the other thing, I'll, I'll, I'll even go one step farther and, and to say that, you know, it, it always struck me uh, that, that we made a huge mistake when we went down this, this path in, in the first place. Uh, and that is that if, if you sit in Baghdad for a year and you don't do anything and you, don't, you never leave your office, uh, the, the promotion panels give extra consideration. Uh, the, um, the, uh, you, know, you get additional time in your tick, you get all of those things. Whereas if you're sitting in a place like Damico or in Jemena uh, or Juba, uh, you're in as difficult a circumstance as any of those other posts. Um, you're getting hardship pay, you're getting some other you know, monuments, but you're not getting anything like the package that we were giving to people in Baghdad or Kabul. And I always thought that it was really terribly unfair uh, to some of our officers who were doing hard jobs in hard places uh, that they weren't getting the same recognition simply because they hadn't made that list. So I, I do hope that, that as we move forward and you know, as we normalize in Baghdad, and, and we certainly are uh, trying to make Baghdad a more uh, you know, normal embassy, uh, I hope that we do the same thing in Kabul. And I, and I do hope that we get away from this idea of you know, the, the, uh, the haves and the have-nots. Who's going to challenge me on top? No, 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 no. <laughs> no actually, I, 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 you know, I guess before you got back to the academy, we actually worked on a project to try to figure out how to extend some tours. Uh, you no, know, I was going to ask you quite a different question, and that is, given all these constraints, so many of which I totally agree with you, we need to be fighting, but we're losing many of those battles. Just asked you, wanted to ask you for your thoughts on how we do business in these posts, in these constraints. I've had some myself. Uh, but, but I'd very much like to hear your thoughts about how we sort of break the concept that we have to do all functions in the formal ways we've done them before. How do, how do we find the techniques to do our jobs well as you experienced? And what did you do? Well, uh, all, all I can say, Ron, is, is that at least in, in, um, in Sana'a, it was still very much retail diplomacy. I mean, it still required going and sitting with people for long hours and drinking lots of tea and having conversations. Uh, and, and again, I, I would say that this is, uh, this is uh, something that is concerning and I think should concern all of us. And that is that there's a conceit in Washington today uh, that you know, the, the idea of actually having people on the ground doing these things isn't all that important because after all, Anyone here in Washington can pick up the phone and call anyone, uh, any place in the world, and have a conversation with them. And, and there is an attitude, I think, that, uh, that that's the same thing. Uh, and certainly in our part of the world, we know that it's not. Uh, we know that unless you, you know, know those people, unless you spend a long time uh, breaking bread with them, getting to know them, uh, that they're not going to have the same kind of conversation with you, and they're not going to be uh, as responsive, and they're not going to be as forthcoming uh, as, as they are if you've done all those things. And so 
uh, my own view is that really not terribly much has happened. You can do certain things. Uh, uh, there were there were a few times where uh, I wanted to, to do a meeting and it was considered to be too too hard to get uh, to get there, or uh, people were a little bit concerned about you know who the people were that I was going to be talking to. Uh, that we did you know we, we set out and, and we set up a, a VTC and and we did it by uh, by VTC. Uh, so we did that a little bit. Uh, but in terms of, of going to um, the president or, uh, or the senior leadership in the government, uh, you had to get in your car and drive over there, uh, and there was really no substitute for that. Uh, uh, the, the other thing, and, and it reminds me of one other point that I wanted to make uh, about presence, and, and precisely this. Uh, when, when things got bad in Sana'a in 2011, uh, and there was uh, kind of what, what people thought at the time was going to uh, devolve into a full-blown civil war. Uh, most of our uh, partners, the, the Brits, the Brits never did, but the, the Europeans did leave, uh, the Asians left, uh, even uh, most of the Arabs left. Um, the Brits were about to leave, except uh, that they were about to leave the day after Ali Abdullah Saleh got blown up in the mosque, and then they decided that they couldn't anymore. Uh, uh, but, uh, but we didn't. Uh, and and I'll, I'll be honest, I use that. I, I dined out on that fact for a long time. And, and, and being able to go to the Emmys and say, look, you know, when, when things got tough, all of, all of these other guys packed up and left, but we stayed. We were part of, we were part of, of what you were doing. We were part of the process. And we stuck it out with you, and and it made a difference. People knew who was there and who wasn't there. People knew who who was you know with them and who wasn't with them. And the fact that we were willing to do that at that particular moment uh, accounted for something, and it and it allowed us. I, I think it made us much more effective in our dip, uh, diplomatic engagement with them uh, that we could say that. I'm afraid. I mean, that was of course 2011. Uh, I'm afraid that were that same situation to arise today, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't make that decision. We wouldn't be able to sustain ourselves that way. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. No, I can't do anything. Sir. Should I uh, unpause the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if I should, but it was like.